This video introduces the use of MATLAB with matrices. So previous videos have looked at definitions of matrices, notation, special cases, and so on. And now what we want to do is look at some tools like MATLAB that can be used to define and store matrices and do some basic arithmetic. The MATLAB environment is defined in such a way that the matrix is actually the default variable type and that makes it very convenient for handling matrices. So also any BODMAS type of operation that is valid on pen and paper and valid with matrices can be carried out on MATLAB using, this is critical, the same syntax. So the user doesn't have to think very hard, they just write it down as they would on a piece of paper. And finally, MATLAB includes a large number of matrix analysis tools, which we will introduce you to later. This video is going to focus on the basics. So defining a matrix. Matrices are defined by their rows and columns, and therefore data entry into MATLAB can be managed also by defining the rows or columns. So MATLAB has a very particular syntax, and this is the most important thing that you need to be aware of. Columns are separated by commas, and rows are separated by semicolons. So that's how MATLAB knows whether you're saying move to a new column or move to a new row. You'll notice you can separate columns with spaces, but I would advise against that as a rule because sometimes the spaces are not obvious and it can lead to silly typos. A comma you can see and there's no confusion. So let's do some examples of simple MATLAB syntax. What we're going to do is show the entry of a two by three matrix. And the way we're going to do it is first define the first row, separating all the elements with a comma. And then having done that, we're going to enter a semicolon, which tells us move to the second row, and we'll enter the second row. Here's the code then. So if you look, what do you notice? First of all, I've entered the elements of the first row separated by commas. One, comma three, comma two. Then I put a semicolon, and then I put the elements of the second row separated by commas. And round it all, I use these square brackets. The square brackets are what MATLAB uses to say I am defining a matrix. If you look at the result, you'll see the top row, 1, 3, 2, corresponds to the first row I put in. And the second row, minus 6, 0, 4, corresponds to the second row I put in. Let's do another example then. This time, we're going to have a three by six matrix, so I need to define the three separate rows, but we're going to use the same syntax. So if we look here, you'll see, first of all, I've started with my big square bracket to say, right, I'm entering a matrix. And then I've put in here six values separated by commas, which are going to correspond to the top row. Then I've entered a semicolon, and after the semicolon, I've put in another six values, which will correspond to the second row. And finally, another semicolon, followed by six more values, and that gives me the third row. So an interim summary. Data entry in this fashion is somewhat clumsy. You can see that from the previous slide, that it's beginning to get quite long to write all these values out. So it may be easier to allocate values directly, especially where a matrix is sparse. Some common matrices are also predefined in MATLAB, and hence shortcuts are provided by MATLAB. Here's an example then. We want to create a matrix with the following information. We know the 2, 3 element, we know the 4, 2 element, and we know the 1, 5 element, and all the others are 0. What do I do then? All I'm going to do is define each value in turn. So the 2, 3 element, I'm going to write a 2, 3 equals 5. The 4, 2 element, I'm going to write a 4, 2 equals 2. And the 1, 5 element, I'm going to write a 1, 5 equals 6. And what do you notice? 
MATLAB has created a matrix which has those values and more importantly what you notice about all the other values which I have not defined. MATLAB has automatically filled them in with zeros. It says you've not told me what they're going to be so for now I will fill with zeros. Key point here is I've defined a 4 by 5 matrix which has only three non-zero values by just writing those three non-zero values. What happens if I want to modify some elements? So I've entered a matrix and I've made a mistake or for another reason I just want to change something. So you'll see here I've got a matrix that's already defined, it's got four values, it's a two by two, but I want to change one of the values. All I do is write directly in to the corresponding position. You'll see here I've written B 2 comma 1, so second row, first column, set the value to 1.5. And what do you notice? It's just overridden that value only and it's left the others by themselves. What about modifying matrix dimensions? So a matrix might already exist, but you might realize, oh, it's not quite the right size and I need to put some new, new values in. Here, you'll see that C is 1 by 4. And what I can do is just by defining a new element, here I've defined the new element as the third row and the second column, and I've said it's minus 5. So MATLAB will put that value in, and it's automatically put zeros in all the other positions which are not yet defined. But now C has become a 3 by 4 matrix. Now you could say this is dangerous as well as an advantage because it does mean MATLAB may resize matrices for you if you do a command like that and you need to be aware of that. Extracting coefficients. This is implicit in what we said before but individual coefficients can be extracted using the equivalent notation. So here you'll notice I've got a large M matrix is 4 by 5. If I want the second row, fourth column, which is here, second row, fourth column, I just write M 2 comma 4 and out comes the value. What if I want to extract a whole row or a whole column? Well MATLAB provides shortcuts for you so that you can do this easily and here we're showing the shortcuts. If you look you'll see the command I've written is M3, comma, colon. Well, before the comma tells me about rows. So that's saying I want the third row because I've got three before the comma. And then the comma colon, so the colon basically means take everything. That's what the colon means. So in other words, give me all the columns. And you'll see the answer down here is it's given me the whole of the third row because I've said I want all the columns in that row. Equivalently, I could write a command something like m colon comma 2 and now you'll see the colon is before the comma so that says take all the rows but I want the second column. So if you look here, all the rows, second column is that one and those are the values that it's given. Matrix transposition. So in MATLAB, transposition is defined using two alternatives. You can use a sort of apostrophe or there's a file transpose. Now there is a warning. If you use the apostrophe, actually it doesn't do transpose. It does complex conjugate transpose. So you need to be careful because if you forget about this subtlety, you might make errors when you have complex matrices. Some examples then. Here I've used the file transpose direct and I've written that DT is transpose D. Well here's D, you can see it's 2 by 3 and D transposed is 3 by 2 and you can see it's done what I expected, columns have become rows, everything is fine. I can also use this sort of apostrophe notation, you'll see here I've written G equals F dash, so F was a row and you'll see G is a column, so in this case everything has worked fine. Here's an example where the apostrophe can mess you up. You'll see that H has got complex numbers in it. So if I do H dash here, then what you notice is that the off diagonal elements are not the same as what you expect from a transpose operation because what it's done is complex conjugate transposed, not just transpose. So you must be aware of that. 
Special matrices. MATLAB's got shortcuts for identity matrices, matrices of zeros, matrices of ones, and diagonal matrices. So let's look at those. Here's a shortcut for an identity matrix, and you'll see the MATLAB command is just to write I, as in E, Y, E, and the number in here is what's the dimension of the identity matrix you want. Here you'll see I've said I3, and I've got a 3 by 3 identity matrix. Here I've written I5, and I get a 5 by 5 identity matrix. What about ones? You've got the same sort of concept, except here you've got to define the row dimension and the column dimension, and the command you want is ones. It's sort of obvious. If you write ones, it gives you a matrix of ones. And here you've got a 3 by 4 matrix of ones. Different example, you'll see I've put 6 by 2, and what do you see? You get a 6 by 2 matrix of ones. In a similar way, there's a command built in by MATLAB called zeros. So if you write zeros, 3 comma 4, you get a 3 by 4 matrix of zeros. Or you can write zeros, 4 comma 5, and you've got a 4 by 5 matrix of zeros. Diag will give you a diagonal matrix, and in a diagonal matrix, all the off diagonals are zero. So all you need to do is supply the diagonal elements. So if you put the diagonal elements into this command, you'll notice the square brackets around the elements, and then the round brackets, because it's an input to the function diag. Then it will put those elements as the diagonal elements of a diagonal matrix. However many elements you supply will give the dimensions of the matrix. Here's a different one. You can see now I only supplied three values, minus 1, 2, minus 45, and so I've got a 3 by 3 diagonal matrix. Addition and subtraction. So this is just a reminder of how addition works. I'm not going to redo that. But just to say that MATLAB handles addition and subtraction exactly as you would expect using normal plus and minus notation. So here's an example. I've defined R as a row vector 1, 2, 4, T as a row vector minus 2, 3, 6. And so then if I just write R plus T, it does the addition for me. Different example. Here, you'll see S is a square matrix, 1, 2, 3, 4. Q is a square matrix, minus 3, minus 4, 0, 2. And if I do S plus Q, MATLAB does the addition for me, exactly as on a piece of paper. The matrices don't have to be square. Here in this example, you'll see that S1 is 2 by 4, Q1 is 2 by 4, and now I've written 2 times S1 minus 3 times Q1, so I've made it slightly more involved, and you can pause the video if you want to check that this has actually worked, but MATLAB has done it for you. Just a reminder, of course, you can't add matrices unless they are the same dimension. Using matrices to store data. This was covered earlier, so just to remind you that you can use rows or columns of matrices to store lots of information. Here I've stored time, temperature, and voltage. And once I've stored data in rows or columns, I can use those rows and columns in a plot command in order to see what's going on. So here I've entered the data, and then I've plotted it. Now, very quickly, I'm going to jump to MATLAB just to show you a live demonstration of what we've been going through here. So there's the command window. And if I go here, I've got a file for you called Matrix Entry, which should be on the website. So what you can do is you can take these commands and you can put them into MATLAB and see what they do. So I can take these commands put them into MATLAB, see what they do. And you'll notice these commands basically replicate what was in the video, so that if you want to, you can copy them into the MATLAB window and see what's going on. So there's another one. You can use as many as you like, but the key thing is everything that was shown in this video, very easy to replicate. Just open the file, copy the commands in, and see what happens. So in summary, we've demonstrated the core matrix capability of MATLAB. Variables in MATLAB are 
automatically interpreted as matrices. That is the default. So normal matrix algebra rules apply and coefficients are defined and accessed using the index of row, comma, 